Not yet? Oh, it does work. OK. Test. You also have one? Huh? I think it works. Yeah? I don't hear it that loud. But. OK, I think we can start. So um, we're Dennis and Ben from Booking.com. Um, we're both called data scientists there. Uh, I've, been work I've started my third year now. You are wrapping up your first year. And <coughs> uh, I think it was a quite interesting uh, first two years. We, had, uh, we are a Perl-based company, so it's a bit weird that we're standing here on a, a PyData conference. Uh, when I started, we were all using Perl as analysts as well, which I thought was really strange. If you look at the community of uh, analysts worldwide, I think Python and R are the biggest languages. And uh, during those two years, we also switched quite fast. Uh, almost everyone uses Python now uh, and R. Some still do use Perl. Um, and that's, that's really uh, much more convenient. We like it a lot. Um, and we also had a really nice year last year because Dennis joined. Um, you brought some ideas to the floor, like uh, trying out Spark. You used it in a previous company. And uh, we spent six months diving deep into it using uh, an existing project that we worked on uh, to try it out, whether it would improve. And the quality of our predictive model went up like crazy. Uh, the performance was really awesome. Uh, working with Spark was so nice and so much better than using uh, reducer scripts with uh, 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 Python and Hive and Uzis. And, uh, so we fell in love. Uh, we trained uh, the entire company almost, and uh, many people are using it now, and we really uh, like it a lot. So for hackathons, we also like to play around with it. Um, let's see. OK, my clicker doesn't work, but. It does. So for Hackathon, we can uh, work uh, two days a month on stuff we like. Um, and I like to play around with Spark. And our, uh, streaming came out uh, with Christmas for Python. So we had four days to play around. You like uh, doing uh, Bayesian uh, statistics. So we uh, were both were playing around with uh, two different things. And we tried to, to merge them together um, to see if we could uh, uh, create a sequential test, testing engine using Spark streaming uh, and to monitor our experiments continuously. Um, the idea being that we could speed up our decision-making process for experiments. So uh, normally you have to specify in advance how, uh, what power you need and how long you have to wait and how many observations, and then you have to wait. Um, but in the meantime, people are peaking, um, and sometimes they see peak values that are pretty extreme and they either stop it or they... Yeah, so uh, we think, uh, based on the literature, that the Bayesian approach would be much better for this uh, case. And we also want to improve the quality of our uh, statistics, so decrease the chance of false positives and negatives. And also, we are a bit geeky, so we like to play around with text streaming. So uh, that was our um, uh, hackathon approach. And that's also a disclaimer for this talk. We haven't productionized uh, what we are discussing today. We're investigating it, and we think it's already really cool to share. Uh, we try to be as transparent as possible what we use, so we're linking to articles and papers that we've used, um, and uh, that should help you to find out whether it's suitable for you. And we, are, we have some examples of where we tried it out. Um, but don't expect really revolutionary things from this. We're just uh, starting and investigating it. Um, so who has already got any experience with Spark Streaming in the room, except for Holden? Okay, that's a couple of hands. Sir, do you want to explain what you have been doing thus far? Yeah? Scream! So we uh, ran in CC, we have no point of organization, internet, and uh, user. And in, is it working? Yes. Ah, okay, so uh, I'm working at Ripe and CC, and uh, we are doing a lot of internet monitoring stuff, and uh, especially BGP monitoring, maybe you know about protocol who is responsible for, uh, for routing, and it's like a large worldwide project who does uh, internet BGP monitoring, and we have a, like a BGP stream from various points around the world, and we're trying to use uh, Spark streaming with Kafka to do real-time BGP analysis to detect various BGP hijacking, route leaking, all fun stuff, and uh, okay. it's like a, one of our applications. Cool. It's not in a production stage. We are also playing with it a bit, uh, but it's kind of cool technology, and we're pretty happy with intermediate results. Okay, 
And another, I saw a couple hands more. I think that's sir, behind you. No? Okay. Someone else maybe? I feel so lonely. We're, we don't have that many people to talk about Spark Streaming in our company, so it's nice to meet up other people <laughs> who also use it. Um, maybe that last one, I'm, I'm curious. Sorry, you have to run all the way to the aisle. Yes, uh, we try to use Spark Streaming for predictive maintenance. Uh, I'm from Wartzilla. Wartzilla produces ship engine. There's a sensor attached to uh, engine that transfer the data. We use Kafka Flume to push the data to a Spark and run machine learning to predict the uh, failure mode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, so we started in, at Christmas and we, we did a really basic thing. We were parsing our events for the, the customer service department and we tried to s find out which um, languages were uh, depleted in resources. Uh, as, so if, if something happens in a certain country and people start calling, uh, then we want to, to uh, be alerted as soon as possible that the um, people who speak French or some other language are really constrained for resources and they need help then we can, can, can help as soon as possible. So that was a simple use case we tried out, uh, just parsing and, and counting. Um, we haven't done any predictive stuff yet, but uh, yeah. For this case, we uh, also tried out with, with uh, Bayesian statistics and experimentation. Um, for the rest, Spark Streaming is a mini batch uh, processing framework. So events that uh, you would normally process uh, in batch, so say a day uh, of data, you now process them every second or five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever uh, threshold you set. And then within that 20 seconds batch interval, you do stuff uh, that is interesting and you save it to a place that people can reuse or you visualize it. Uh, as you see in that uh, picture that I think almost everyone copy pastes uh, who explains streaming, um, you have a, a source of data going into Spark Streaming, the source uh, being Kafka, I think that's a really popular source. We use it as well. Um, and then you save it back to uh, HDFS so people who use Hive can access your data or you visualize a, a dashboard. Um, the nice thing about Spark is that, is that it automatically recovers from failures. So um, if things break, then it's pretty good at recovering, which is a really important thing because yeah, things break, especially on the big scale. It dynamically balances uh, resource uh, usage, which is nice. And you can also enrich your data. So if you have uh, an integer coming in, and that integer maps to a certain city, and that city has a lot of descriptive statistics ready and waiting in a different table, you can um, uh, just receive the integer with the city uh, ID, and then enrich it, and do all kinds of stuff with it. Uh, because Spark can have cached data ready, and uh, that's also really nice. And everything you can do with Spark, the, the SQL engine, uh, machine learning library, uh, you can apply that to your stream. So it's really powerful. And we're really happy with 1.6 uh, also added uh, Python to the list of supported, uh, or yeah, it was already there, but now the, um, there's this thing in Kafka, the, the direct stream, which is really helpful, that was suddenly available for Python as well. So we tried it out, and we feel really happy that we now have access to our live data. Normally developers have that, so they, they have uh, all kinds of custom libraries in Perl uh, in our company, and they use it. Uh, but for analysts, we are no used to process things in batch the day after or the week after, uh, which is fine in many use cases and perfectly normal. Uh, but I think you can imagine use cases where you want speed uh, and you want to know things as soon as possible. So we're now building real-time data products. Smile. Um, this is a bit of the infrastructure, how we use it. Um, so be beginning uh, top left, we have, uh, oh, I think I also had a laser, right? Do we have a laser yeah. on this thing? Uh, okay, it doesn't work. Anyway, we have people using our website. They're looking for hotels, for cities, and they're generating raw events. So uh, top right, there's a blog post written by the guy who is maintaining our event store. Uh, we have billions of events per day. We have more than 100 megabytes per second and six terabytes a day in events. And by far, that is not in, the far majority is not interesting for me as an analyst. I really want a, a small uh, substream of that, that big stream of events. Uh, and we use a combination of RIAC and, and Perl modules to look into every event that's uh, being generated and then create substreams, uh, for example, a customer service substream or a hotel using our backend system substream or a uh, people using the front end uh, uh, substream. So we create all these, these specific nice rivers of data. Uh, they go into Kafka. Uh, Kafka then um, um, 
yeah, Pip connects, allows other clients to connect to it, uh, Spark Streaming being one of the clients. Um, and yeah, once it's there, you can, we can finally use it. Um, that's basically uh, how we set it up. There's still uh, quite a delay in, uh, in this pipeline. I think we have around 20 second, 30 second delay, but still waiting a day and a half versus uh, 20 seconds is still quite an improvement. So we're, we're quite happy to have this up and running. We do have uh, some challenges. So if there are consultants who are really specialized in this stuff or people who want to be working with this stuff, I know a lot, uh, please reach out. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm really curious to hook up with people who have more experience and uh, have things running smoothly because I still have some, some hiccups to deal with. Um, and that's basically all I wanted to share about Spark Streaming uh, because, yeah, uh, we also wanted to dig into the, the experimentation part. Uh, but assume, yeah, so let's assume that this, this is working. We prototype it, that, that works. Uh, and we are you keeping track live of uh, the amount of people in, in certain experimentation variants. Um, and given that, then we dive into the experimentation part. So this is maybe a bit insulting to refresh the A-B testing uh, uh, stuff, but in essence, you want to test a new variant, maybe if you're on a landing page or you have a different color scheme or you have a different flow or whatever you change. And then we test it out by dividing the traffic. You do it 50-50 or maybe 5% goes into the variant and the rest stays normal. And after a time, you observe which group has the highest conversion rate or a different metric. And uh, you put that version full on and you improve your product. And this is the core of, of our company. Company, everything that people propose or suggest has to go through this this uh, this process. Uh, so it's really essential that this works uh, smoothly. Um, so we have hypothesis testing, the mu one and mu two being the means of the of the different groups, the null hypotheses, the alternative hypotheses, and p values are crucial, being the result of chi square testing. Uh, where the p-value is a probability under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true of obtaining a result equal or more extreme than what was actually observed. Dennis pushed me to read it out loud instead of paraphrasing my own p-value definition. So given this, uh, Dennis, would you like to go into the Bayesian stuff or one, do you want to share a joke first maybe with yeah, the group? No. No jokes? No jokes. <laughs> we, we had five jokes when we prepared this talk, but I think he's too nervous to share it now. So. Okay, yeah. do, do your serious stuff then. That's great. Okay. Ah, yes, this is still your slide, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I can also explain it. So if you um, do a hypothesis test like this, you want to, uh, you make your hypothesis, it's normally that um, there's no difference between the groups, so the means equal each other, and uh, you want to contradict that. So that's already a kind of weird setup, I think, because you um, investigate the opposite thing that you really want to show because you want to show that there is a difference. Um, and in this setup, you can do two kinds of errors. So first is if um, you say there was an effect, but there wasn't. And the other one is if there was an effect and you cannot detect it. So that's also a recap because this will be um, important later. And so at the hackathon, I looked into uh, Bayesian A-B testing because the so reason for that was a lot of big companies, uh, big A-B testing companies changed to Bayesian. And uh, we were very interested why and if it could also be useful for us. And I think uh, it has some very, very nice properties uh, where we can really gain a lot from. So as a recap, the base theorem, I think most of you know that. There's, um, so we want to... Um, uh, estimate the probability of our hypothesis H given some data. It's called here evidence in the slide, and you can reformulate that with um, Bayes' theorem in the probability of the hypothesis itself times the probability of the data given the hypothesis divided by the probability of the evidence. So an easy example, for example, would be um, you want your hypothesis is it will rain tomorrow and your data is the weatherman said it will rain and then you go over to the other side then the probability of your hypothesis so that it will rain tomorrow is um, for Amsterdam very high for example and the other one a probability that the weatherman says it will rain um, given your hypothesis is uh, also very high and we will 
don't need the, the lower term since it's just a, since it's just a normalization term. Okay, and um, for this talk, I uh, used as an example the beta binomial case. It's like the easiest model in Bayesian statistics, but um, all of this, will, what I show, also works for um, general distributions, so normal case and higher, but uh, that would be too heavy on the mathematics, so I boiled it down to binomial. So if we have two groups, A and B, um, normal A-B test would be we check conversion rate. So we have events, a uh, person books at booking.com, or he doesn't. So we have a zero, one event, which is a binomial distribution. And so your groups A and Bs can be sort of as a long row of zeros and ones, and your conversion rate would be the probability of a booking. And um, what we want to estimate is really this P1 and P2 of the both groups. So to get the probabilities of the conversion rates and then compare them to, uh, to each other to see if there's a difference or not. Um, Bayesian way of doing this is um, taking the beta as a conjugate. So uh, it's very common to take as a distribution for this piece, the di beta distribution. Beta, I put on here the definition, but it's not so important. So if you want to code this, just import beta from side by stats, and then uh, for, can forget about it. Uh, on the bottom is the beta function, so on, in the denominator. And um, like on the bottom of the page is the update rule. So if you, um, if you already observed some data, then you just um, count how many ones, so how many bookings were in your data and how many misses. So where that here would be the number of hits, so the number of bookings, and n would be the overall number, so n minus z is, um, is the number of misses, and then you can always update this. So this is also a sequential process, so if you collected a thousand, already a thousand samples, then you can always update this. So that uh, goes very well also with this batch processing in Pyspark. And um, this beta, you normally choose it, it looks like this. Um, so when you do a Bayesian model, you always want to update your prior belief, so what you think, um, into your posterior. So you collected some data, and you want to refine your model with the collected data. And um, here, for example, um, you see that the beta function is very flexible. So if we would estimate that there's maybe 70% conversion rate on our page, then you could say, okay, I don't, yeah, it's booking. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, you could say, okay, I take a very narrow beta because I think it, uh, even if my new version is good, it will not vary a lot from this, what I already observed. Or if you say I'm totally unsure uh, what the conversion rate will be, then you just take like the straight line, that would be an uninformative prior and then just update from there. So this would give the model no information before. And so this prior thing is always um, what people say, okay, Bayesian stuff is not um, objective because normally when you start, then you say, okay, this is my prior. I have a 5% conversion rate and it varies a little bit around that, but that's a subjective opinion. Um, I will leave it with that for now, but I will show you later a way how to uh, fit objective priors. So that's also, you can also estimate this price from data. And then uh, here I did a very simple code example. So we um, sampled two binomial distributions of size 1 million. So it's a A-B test. Each group had 1 million samples. Then I have a conversion of 5% in the one group. And in the B group, I also implement a lift of 1%. Now there would be like a normal A-B test setup. And then um, you just collect the number of hits. That would be AA here, some A, so, so once the number of misses would be BA, and next step would be now sample from your beta. So you update your beta. Here I took an uninformative prior, you see the ones, and then you just update your beta, sample from that, do the same thing for the other group, sample from it, and then you can already say stuff about probability. So you can just say, so I sampled, um, for my group A and my group B from a beta function with the distributions, and then I can already say, okay, given the data, I'm sure 
um, that B is bigger than A, so B is better than A by 98% almost, which is pretty strong compared to a p-value, which almost tells you nothing. So the p-value would tell you something like, uh, yeah, what Ben said. <laughs> okay, I, um, yeah, here are some plots. So I plotted here the John posterior of the both. You can, the, the x-axis high here is the conversion rate of um, group A, so from zero to one. The y-axis is the conversion rate from zero to one for group B. So the mid, and then we just get the joint posterior. So we look how, how is this, are these two groups compared to each other. So the middle line, if, the, if a point lies on the middle line, it would say, okay, there's completely no difference between, between both groups. And if it's higher, then you say, I have more evidence for A. Uh, for B, and if it's lower, then you say I have more evidence for A. So this probability that I showed before would be just the integral about over the half planes here. And then I plotted uh, some updates of this A-B test. So after this was like 20 samples, you are completely unsure where your parameter values are. You see this on the big, with a big blob. Then you collect some more data, get more sure, but you still have a lot on the side of A. So you think I'm more sure that B is better, but I'm not really sure. And collecting more and more data, then the blob gets smaller. And in the end of the test, you see that all the probability mass lies above the axis. And you say, OK, now I can accept. So that's the easiest way for an A-B test. Um, but there's a much cooler way, which I will show you next. We first need some definition for that. That is the highest density interval. That's the Bayesian version of the confidence interval. Um, okay, let's skip the math. The definition of, so you can think of this just as a water line. So you look, um, look where do I have to, uh, when I have a water line, and cut this down to the x-axis where does 95% uh, of my probability mass lies. So you just go up and down and see if I take the integral from left to right, where is it 90, where 95% of the integral, the mass of the integral. Two examples. Okay, and with this setup, um, you can do a much nicer thing that's called uh, the rope that was um, done by John Kruschke in his uh, little polemic uh, article Bayesian estimation supersedes the t-test. So a rope is a very little region around the zero. And um, yeah, now the nice thing about the highest density interval is that we get, so I, I plotted here the difference of the means of the group and the posterior distribution of that one. Nice one is that we get a real probability distribution, so we don't have a confidence interval that is random, but we can really say we are 95% sure, given the data, that our, that our point lies inside this interval. And then the rope is a small region around zero, because if you are true to yourself, there will be always some difference between two groups if you measure them, because of noise or because of whatever. And um, you can choose this interval by business value. So you say, okay, if I just have a lift that is very, very tiny, like 0.1%, uh, then I don't care. So I just don't care, and I wouldn't put it full on. Also, if I lose a little bit, then I also don't care. And that, um, that expands the zero to a complete interval, and you can look where your highest density interval lies compared to this, um, to this rope. And then you get the following two decision rules. So a parameter value is not credible or rejected. So you accept H1. If the uh, complete HDI lies outside the rope, and on the other hand, if the complete uh, HDI falls inside the rope, you can even accept your null hypothesis, which is also completely not possible in normal testing. So you can also only reject with p-values, not accept. It's just pretty nice, I think. Okay, and um, this, this setup makes also sequential testing possible. Here's a plot from a recent article of, two, uh, of some Stanford professors that work for Optimizely. That is what happens if you do sequential testing with a normal p-value. 
So th that would mean you um, take a threshold, maybe alpha equals 0.1, and then you stop your test once your p-value, so you monitor it all the time, and you stop it when it uh, goes below your threshold. And uh, you can just simulate that. And for example, if you choose alpha 0.1, which is common in business, then your real error level is 80%. So you do almost everything wrong. That's a very big um, uh, danger in the settings. Okay, and also Kruschke that did the same thing for the Bayesian setup. Yeah, I, I copied the plot uh, with the rope thing. And on the left side, you see the frequentist version, so the normal p-value version, and you see the false alarm rate, like the false positives going up, 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 the more samples you get. Uh, when you stop with the rope, so you just say, okay, I stop when my HDI falls outside the rope, then it levels at 10%, which is very nice. And so you could do continuous monitoring of your A-B test without um, having to fear of this multiple testing stuff. Okay, so this is nice, uh, but I only could find, on this approach, I only could find um, simulations. So simulations are good, but I'm from mathematics, so I like proofs. And like three weeks ago, there was a super nice article from Microsoft, and I also want to show this really quick. So another approach of A-B testing in Bayesian world is to do base factors. So you just look at the odds of, your, of the probability of your hypothesis, so your one hypothesis given the data, divided by the probability of your zero hypothesis. So how probable is it that there's an effect or that there's no effect? And then you look at the odds. So if this, um, this thing would be like nine, then you would say my alternative hyp hypothesis is nine times more likely than the other one. And um, Again, with base rules, you can uh, split that up into two terms, the base factor and the posterior odds. Um, for simplicity, we now take posterior odds equal one. So we say we don't know. We say they are equally likely, and then we are left with the base factor. Um, so once to implement that, I also, this, uh, with this, you could implement it in Python. But B is just the beta function, uh, which is in SciPy special, and then you just plug it in here. Uh, I did that. You might get some problems with underflow because the numbers get very, very small, but then you can just take the logarithm of this and use beta ln. So if somebody wants to implement that. Um, and now um, the guys from Microsoft Research showed when we, when we use this base factor as a stopping rule, so we say we stop our A-B test if the base factor goes over a certain threshold, let's say nine, so if base factor is above nine, then um, rejecting the alternative will expose us to risk of a false rejection or discovery of one divided by k plus one. And this is like a super strong result because if we put k equal to one, that would mean if we use the stopping rule that we, of all our full-ons, only 10% would be wrong, which is much better than in frequentist uh, approaches. Okay, now, um, so now I always took like uninformative priors and or said you can guess one, but here's also a very nice article from the same people from Microsoft that um, write down an expectation maximization algorithm, how you can fit from your past data the prior for your models. So you look, for example, you have one page and you already run like 100 experiments there and then you can already estimate how probable it is that there will be a lift or not. And then you fit that as a prior, it's called empirical base, and then you have a very, very nice test. With, so you don't have this subjectivity and you have optimal stopping rules. Okay, my idea, which I wanna test next, uh, next is, so on this base factor level, you have um, the theorem for good stopping, and on the other hand, you have this rope model from from Kruschke, where you have this parameter estimation, so you really see how your parameters are distributed. And there's another article of Kruschke um, who shows how you, can, how you can combine both models. So we could take one branch uh, to stop the A-B test and the other branch 
to evaluate all the parameters and have really nice distributions and can really say something like, okay, now we are like 90% sure that A is bigger, better than B. Okay, that was oh. the mass part. All right. You still have one slide left. Really? <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, we did the same. Okay, uh, this is just when to use sequential testing. So uh, in a lot of, lot of use cases, it doesn't really make sense, although a lot of people might use it. So, for example, if you have a fashion site and you have completely different customers, maybe on a Monday than on a Sunday, then um, you want to test the whole time because when you do sequential testing and you, on Wednesday you, it already says significant, but you have completely different users later in the week, then you might want to test every week. So for a seasonality stuff, it uh, might be better. But if you have a decision where you like evaluate every week, then check if it's significant or not, and then do another week, and then do another week, then you're again in a sequential setup. And... Um, so this would be very useful for us, I think, to stop negative experiments because you, you might have, um, so not every, everything is neutral or success when, you, when you're really an experimental company. So you might also very, uh, get worse results than before. And this uh, can be a stopping rule. So you could stop negative experiments really quick without guessing. So with the p-value you would guess, or you would constantly monitor and get also this uh, alpha error accumulation, and here you ha would have a proven decision rule to when to stop a bad experiment. Okay. Right. Let's wrap up with some uh, examples. Uh, these are four experiments. Which of the left side or the right side, which one was significant and you think we put full on, as in we deployed the entire website? So we're looking at p-values and how they fluctuated during the experiment. Who says left? One hand, two hands. Who says right? All right. What's the left side? So you see that the p-value converges to a really small number uh, after uh, yeah, these are uh, hours. So I think was, this was one week of experimentation. And after, after a couple of days, it already became significant and it stayed there. So this is an example of how p-values can fluctuate. Uh, on the right side, we have two AA experiments. So we didn't change anything. We were just testing whether everything was still working fine. And um, you, know, you, can, you can imagine that these are just four examples. But in some cases, uh, if people are peaking here, and this was maybe a bit more, it was just reaching the threshold that people get worried, and then they turn it off. Well, nothing is problematic here. This is completely fine. Uh, so that's, that's uh, if you peak, which people say they don't do, but they do in practice, then you see the p-values are pretty fluctuating a lot. Um, now, the left side seems to be fine, but if you simulate um, AA experiments, then you can also uh, get a lot of uh, converging p-values that, that become and stay significant over time. And that's related to what Dennis said with the 80% false, uh, uh, false positives. So th this, this might seem fine, but these could also be false positives. We don't know for sure. So we tried out all the stuff we uh, discussed before. And I'm really happy with my GIFs. Uh, we have Slack for a short while now, and everyone is sharing GIFs in Slack at the moment. This is my first relevant GIF that I can share on Slack with people. Uh, this is the joint posterior, and these are actual experiments. Uh, and you see the first step, this is, I think, we're now at the end of February on the left, and it starts in December, half December, then you see this really big bulb when we don't know really what, what is going to be the case, but it converges quite soon, uh, up to a point where it is, is it, is, are these the significant experiments or not? What do you think? Okay, I think I'll have to wrap up. These are not the uh, significant experiments. So it converges on the line, so nothing is wrong here. And these are the ones who did become significant. And you see it's a really tiny effect. At Booking we are interested in, in tiny effects. I mean, the scale is huge. So if, if there's a 0.5% uh, lift uh, for all the bookings per day, per year, that's gonna be quite a lot of money. That's why the, the bulbs are also small. 
Um, but these ones actually converge into 99% probability that the, the variant is uh, different from uh, the base. So the, we have nothing to worry about. The four experiments were fine according to the Bayesian uh, approach. Uh, I'm not going to show you the stuff that we did wrong. Uh, I don't think my manager like, would like that. So let's wrap up. Uh, thanks for your attention. If you have questions, ideas, suggestions, I don't know if I have to park them or I can allow them. So at the moment we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, if anyone has them, I'll bring the mic over and you can ask questions to these people at we're booking. We have the first question over there. Hi, so I was wondering about metrics that weren't a conversion rate. So yeah. if you want to count, measure counts or something like a revenue metric, yeah. um, what sort of distributions would you use? Um, so the Kruschke built uh, in his article, he used something like the T-distribution that would also work for revenue stuff. So, um, yeah, but uh, that's a little bit more complicated. You would need to use Monte Carlo estimation. Um, but the, the distribution he fits are very nice. It's a hierarchical model, and you will get also get, um, get spread parameters for outliers and stuff like that. So I'd check the article. That's a good one. Uh, thanks for a very nice presentation. Uh, so when you do like uh, the traditional A-B testing, so say like with, this, uh, with a Z or a T, and then you, you can get like a, an estimate of how much samples you need before you actually start, right? If you forget about the sequential testing stuff. Yeah. Does this Bayesian approach also give you something like that? Because, well, some of the websites are not a big, as big as yours, right? So I have yeah. to worry as well like, about how many samples I have. Um, that's also possible. Also covered in the same article of Kruschke. Yeah. Then we have time for one more question. In that case, these folks will be around, so if there's any more further questions, you can always ask them. Can I please get a nice hand for these two fine gentlemen who just gave a speech?